Hello, everybody. Welcome to uh, the latest uh, Radical Exchange live stream. Uh, my name is Matt Pruitt, and I'm here with Crystal Good, Enoch Lang, and Tracy Bowen. Um, I, uh, I would just like to introduce the panel really quickly by saying that, um, you know, Radical Exchange has done all kinds of, uh, of work and organizing around the, around the data issue. Um, for, for quite some time. And one of the most common questions that I get is, um, you know, what, what, are, what are people doing? What can, what can we get involved with? And, um, you know, what are the different sort of approaches that are, that are going on out there in the community around um, like taking practical steps towards organizing around uh, data? And uh, all three of, uh, of the guests today um, are, are folks who have uh, different approaches to that and great ideas about that. Um, and uh, so I'm really excited to hear this conversation. And uh, with that, I will uh, turn it over to our moderator, uh, the inimitable uh, Crystal Good. So thank you. Good morning, good night, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Uh, my name is Crystal Good, uh, but I'm also known as social media senator for the Digital District of West Virginia. You all may not know that, but I made up my own political office um, to represent the digital sphere um, because I love this quote from June Jordan. You know, sometimes you have to make up your own power, right? And so that's what I did and excited to be with Tracy Bowen, who is a uh, the founder of Controller and Decentral and Inclusive Decentralized Data Union, data researcher uh, at Southwest Creative Technology Network, Mozilla Creative Media Award recipient and post grad law student um, who, like myself, I'm excited to learn from you, mixes the creative with the digital, uh, with the literacy and education. And also Enoch Lang, a California based lawyer and entrepreneur first founding a law firm, LTL Attorneys, and then helping start an artificial intelligence software company, Mega Mation. And Enoch ha is helping and has started the Data Divided Dividend Project to help consumers collectively exercise their data rights and collectively bargain with tech companies. And so uh, being the social media senator for the Digital District of West Virginia, I know a little bit about collective bargaining. Uh, Grew up in West Virginia, Central Appalachia, and uh, that comes with a history of knowing how to strike. Um, so I think my first strike was with uh, the United Food Workers, stood with coal miners, I've stood with teachers, um, and come from a long history of, of, of labor and resistance. Um, and the example that I like to use when talking about data rights is uh, using the analogy of the coal miners. Uh, the coal miners just uh, last year stood on the train tracks saying that we mined that coal and if you don't pay us for it, it's not gonna leave the train station. Uh, and the black jewel miners stood on the train tracks there in West Virginia and demanded that they would be paid for uh, the coal that they mined. And that's the analogy that I like to use when thinking about data rights and data dignity uh, we mined the data and we should be paid for it. Um, and so Tracy, Enoch, I'd like to just say that in West Virginia, in our history, we talk about the Blair Mountain, the Battle of Blair Mountain, where the coal miners wore red bandanas and they called them the redneck miners and they stood in solidarity, black miners, uh, first generation Appalachian immigrant miners stood together in one of America's bloodiest uh, battles for labor. And because the miners wore red bandanas, I've decided that perhaps data dignity and data rights needs a bandana of their own. So I'm gonna wear my purple <laughs> bandana today. Maybe we can get a solidarity little trend going here uh, that if you support the data union, you too will wear your purple bandana. Um, but I'm happy to be here with you all. I'm excited to learn um, from, from both of your projects. So, uh, so welcome, welcome. So Tracy, um, mm -hmm. you're coming. I'm, I'm super excited. Um, Enoch, I'm super excited to talk to you too, but there's a lot about you on the internet. Um, uh, hanging out with a fellow named Andrew Yang, getting a lot of things started. Um, but Tracy, tell us about what you're doing and where you're coming to us uh, from the world and what you're excited to talk about today. Okay, um, well, I'm actually 
I'm British, but I'm actually in Bali right now. So it's okay. like really late for me. Um, but like, so I, I actually come from a musical background. So I come from an artistic background, but I got interested in tech and blockchain and crypto a good few years ago now. I was actually in the first meetup uh, when Vitalik came to London and proposed Ethereum. That's how long ago, <laughs> I, you know, that's how long I've been in this, in this kind of blockchain decentralized sphere. But um, recently that, you know, so all of that kind of piqued my interest um, into all things decentralized. And, you know, I was kind of, kind of eager and curious to know the solutions that people were talking about. And um, that kind of led me to data. And I, uh, yeah, I kind of looked at these things that people were making, data markets and all that sort of interesting stuff. And um, I got introduced to a creative technology lab in Bristol, the UK, and uh, they were running a fellowship um, where you could research data for a year. So I pitched uh, making the data market and some other wild ideas and they went for it um, and now they're supporting uh, me to build um, a decentralized data union called controller and then I got involved with um, RxC radical exchange so um, I, I met some amazing people already. Um, one of them in particular, Shiv Malik, who's the head of growth at Streamer, who's my personal mentor. And, you know, we're, we're starting a very exciting project that we're just calling, the working title is the Spotify Data Union. And um, that's really a David and Goliath story about going up against big tech and taking, you know, kind of taking the fight to Spotify. Uh, but it's, it's about fairness, it's about redistributing the income uh, that these big platforms make. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, that's, that's, that's essentially what I'm doing now. I could break it down a bit more, but um, I don't know if we should get... Yeah, let's, yeah. yeah, thank you, Tracy. Um, excited to, to dig into those, uh, those, those, those a little bit more but yeah we'll you know, later. Tell, yeah tell us about how you came into uh the fight for data rights yeah i would say that um uh, i was inspired by um one of the platforms that andrew yang talked about a lot when he was running for um, presidential candidate in the united states for 2020 one of the things that he talked about was the data bill of rights which i know crystal is familiar with and um uh, after he suspended his campaign, uh, I went, I, I've known Andrew for 25 years. We went to law school together at Columbia. Um, I went out to see him in New York and we talked about the passage of the California Consumer Privacy Act, which is the CCPA, which had a lot of the um, data rights that he discussed on the, on the campaign trail, including the data bill of rights that he proposed. And so um, we decided to, um, see if we could start a, um, a movement based around the authorized agent provisions of the CCPA to help American consumers exercise their rights that they're given under the CCPA in a collective manner so that um, they can collectively bargain with technology companies. And so that's kind of how I got into it. So, you know, the thing, um, and I think maybe we should just kind of just be, you know, let's just talk about what data is and this data labor, um, because I think what's so interesting to me about this conversation is, you know, whether you're talking about different unions, actors, teachers, um, electricians, right? They're a specific group uh, that performs a specific uh, type of labor, whereas with data, I don't know who on the planet isn't uh, contributing to the data labor economy, um, but I think that this is where it gets, um, you know, in West Virginia or uh, all across the world, like what is data labor and how are we creating this? Can you, can you all just talk about that a little bit? You know, no, right. Okay. So, <laughs> 
there is there is actually a lot of people who think that data isn't labor <laughs> but um it's it's essentially because we are producing this thing uh which has now become a commodity um you know and that's another argument like some people think that data shouldn't be a commodity and data shouldn't be sold but you know my argument is like it's already been commodified so you know what are we going to do about it mm -hmm. you know um so that's it that's that's as simple as it gets you know we are inadvertently uh producing this information um called data and um we are not actually getting any benefit uh any monetary benefit anyway from it i mean some people some people are actually quite comfortable with the fact that they give away you know their personal data for access to an app some mm -hmm. people are, are absolutely fine with it um but i think what people like me want is i want there to be like a choice you know right now there is no choice uh for people who want to share in this data economy that's um you know basically ruled by like a very few uh big tech companies and no one can no one no, you know no one can get to this big massive pool of money which they helped generate um yeah and, yeah. and some of the way some of the ways that we're all that we're that we're creating the data uh is in you know is in is in our clicks um enoch i i love that um you know uh that the data dividend um uh, social media platform really offers the public some 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 basic ways to understand how how we're creating data and it's through our clicks and through our likes and through our our dialogue online all of that is being extracted i mean uh i'm i'm not being over the top i mean every piece of uh, of our digital footprint is being tracked by somebody is that correct yeah and i think that the public is starting to become more and more aware of this uh with the rise of the doc, you know, the docudrama, the social dilemma on Netflix, I think that's taking the message to a wider audience. Um, and of course, I think uh, this, this great book by Shoshana Zuboff, uh, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism, which mm. is, um, I think, really kind of started together with Jaron Lanier's 10 Arguments for Deleting Your Social mm -hmm. Media. I think these two books together with that docudrama is really making consumers much more aware of what's happening when you go online. And mm -hmm. I love, um, Crystal, your, your, um, your analogy where you say we have traded the miner's pick for the computer click mm -hmm. um, in, in the talk that you gave, which was great um, about, for radical exchange, I think, back in June. So I, I don't think you're being over the top. I mean, I think it's just a fact at this point that everything you do online, everything you do on your phone, everything you do in your apps is pretty much tracked and logged somewhere. And yeah. And and I loved you know Tracy and, and Enoch. I, I feel very really fortunate because before we started this talk, I got to listen to you all talk, um, and you know kind of break down where we are in the fight for data rights. And I use that language because I come from a union background, and it's always a fight. It's a fight in West Virginia um, to this to this day. Just you know, last year, uh, the year before that, when the teachers went on strike and 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 sort of set off a revolution across America around education education. Um, and so it's something uh, that's very familiar to me. And I understand, um, you know, uh, this language. And so I have a quick question for both of you all, because when you talk about union, to me, that means strike. So what is it, the collective bargaining that, um, whether it's California, America, uh, the UK, the UE, the world, right? How How is the public, right, going to show resistance in uh in this in this 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 data labor data rights economy or is this strictly something that will be um fought through uh policy uh and and laws but is there an action that we the public right can organize around in this conversation um I'll, I'll go ahead and start uh on that one I think that uh, 
that's a complicated question, and it can probably be broken down into a couple of different areas. I think, you know, your question about what can the public do, um, I think that the answer is, you know, right here in Jaron Lanier's book, um, 10 Arguments for Deleting Your Social Media Account Right Now. Um, the idea I deleted that, Facebook. I'm never going back. Okay. Does that count? I mean, like, I, I, <laughs> give me my Twitter and I know Instagram's on my Facebook, but it's a little bit difficult. So there, I mean, it's kind <laughs> of like cheating on your, on your diet, but uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I think that's a simple move that, that anybody can make. Um, there's an organization which many radical exchange um, uh, people are part of called datadividends.org, um, which has uh, a number of proposals on there, but one of them is a data strike. And so it's yes, very yes. similar to the language that um, labor uses, Crystal, as, as you've talked about in West Virginia. So I think, you know, in terms of what everyday people can do, I mean, you can choose to vote with your data and mm -hmm. go to poly go to platforms that um, respect your data dignity a lot more. Now, in terms of the bigger picture, which is kind of, um, uh, is it a law issue? Is it a policy issue, et cetera? I think that the analogy that I, that I like to use is the, the four legs of a chair. If any of the legs are missing, then it's gonna be really hard to have a chair. Um, I view the, the problem of um, data dignity as one that requires all four legs to solve. So leg number one is gonna be grassroots consumer awareness, which we see building, um, I think, probably to the tipping point at this point, starting with Cambridge, the Cambridge Analytica scandal and moving on towards, um, towards uh, the social dilemma that, like we talked about. So there needs to be the first leg, which is consumer awareness. Consumers have to know about the problem and have to care about it, which I think is starting to happen. Um, leg number two is there have to be easy to use technology solutions for consumers, kind of like a set it and forget it. And I think that's what Tracy, Shiv at Streamer, um, a lot of the, um, the, the technology companies out there are trying to build these types of um, easy to use technology solutions that allow consumers to take back control over their data. So that's just important as leg number one because without technology, easy to use technology solutions, you know, consumer awareness isn't going to do anything. I think leg number three is uh, better laws and better regulation. And you're seeing the EU start that with the GDPR and you're seeing California take that up with the CCPA and now the recently passed California Privacy Rights Act. You're seeing a number of states starting to pass similar legislation or at least consider similar legislation in the United States. I think right now the big three are uh, that are considering something similar to the CCPA are the states of Virginia, New York and Washington, uh, which have all taken up similar legislation in 2021. And then I think the fourth leg is enforcement. And, you know, because if you have laws on the books, but they're not being enforced, then they're no good. And so on the enforcement side, I think you're seeing um, the Department of Justice in the United States and the Federal Trade Commission in the United States starting to look at the big tech platforms. There's been a number of times where the CEOs have been called to um, Washington, D.C. to testify in the last calendar year. Um, and you're also seeing organizations like the data dividend project, um, like the data union, uh, spring up and try to help consumers navigate and enforce their rights that they've been given under the CCPA and under the CPRA. And in fact, um, Consumer Reports is also doing this as well. Um, so I think you're seeing movement in all four of those legs. And I'm very excited to see what 2021 will bring along all four of those fronts in the United States. Me too, me absolutely. too. Uh, absolutely. And, you know, I can definitely, I can second that. It's like, I love the way that, you know, Enoch has his strategy. Mm -hmm. I have my strategy. And ha as he said, you know, we need all of those legs of the chair, you know, because um, we're all fighting towards, you know, we're all fighting for the same goals, for a fair share of equity. You know, we're fighting towards egalitarianism. For people to have data rights, you know, and um, I think in terms of data unions, the resistance then is to form our own technology to mm. participate in the data economy market and to advocate for ourselves. 
So, you know, I'm, you know, I'm part of the movement that are, you know, maybe tech enablers and building this tech so ordinary people can access this market and, you know, obviously access their own property then. I mean, and that's going to be another conversation whether, you know, data is property or can come under the legal property framework. But um, in the simplistic term, it's, you know, it's something you produce, therefore it's yours, right? Um, and I think that, I think that's so, that, that's essentially very, very important um, for the future and for, you know, new civic design, um, because, you know, I just believe that these, these structures really can't be reformed. I mean, for me, I think we, uh, we have to change. We so have to that, change the structure. So the, the products, right? So, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm from central Appalachia, West Virginia. It's uh, one of the uh, poorest states in America. My county and my city is one of the lowest life expectancies in America. So basically just living there, uh, you are gonna die earlier. Uh, I could give you a lot of um, shocking statistics um, about what life is like um, in, in central Appalachia and inside of that uh, being a black Appalachian, you know, it, it, just, it just keeps going. So Tracy, one of the things I love about reading about you is that you're committed to, you know, really the voices that are unheard um, and really kind of serving marginalized people. And Absolutely. so, you know, in, 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 and this is my, you know, this is the lens that I come into this conversation with because the needs are so overwhelming that when mm -hmm. you start talking to people about, hey, you know, uh, you're, you're giving away all your data on these social media platforms and I think you should stop. <laughs> Uh, this becomes sort of like, wait a minute, I, I can't, you know, I can't fight for clean water, I can't fight for education, I can't do all of these things, and this data conversation is very complex. Um, but, you know, one of the things that I love about the way that each of you frame it and the idea of, like, how do we start to start multiple conversations so that people can find different, you know, entry points is, you know, this is just another way that humans are being, you know, oppressed across every, it's just, it's another vehicle, um, uh, you know, to extract, right? And there's one thing that I know um, where I'm from and what makes um, Appalachia and Central Appalachia and the story of coal, you know, universal is it's the extraction economy, right? It's the continuing of taking something, right? We're going to take something, it has value, but somehow we're going to do this, this, <laughs> you know, we're going to set the terms of it. Um, and so when we're talking about, uh, you know, data to marginalize folks, um, how do you frame it, Tracy, as, you know, uh, as something else that you need to pay attention to? Um, I know that you do a lot of work around environmental and that's a passion of, of, of mine too. And, and I just find that, you know, sometimes it just becomes overwhelming. So what is your strategy in the work you're doing to reach marginalized communities? I mean, I think essentially is to um, not over kind of um, explain or um, just simplify, but like, you know, in terms, in terms of my state union, right? When someone asks me what it is, it's simply a way for you to make money from your data, right? And then in terms of the tech, um, you know, we are making it as frictionless as possible so people don't have to then fiddle around with cryptocurrencies outside the platform because that's a whole nother, you know, you're like, no one's doing that. You know, you can barely understand what's going on with this whole data economy thing. And then somebody wants you to kind of like take these cryptocurrencies that you really don't even understand about and then go outside this platform and then try and find an exchange and all that kind of stuff. So like we're, we're because I have an innate um, understanding, it's like being through this journey myself, you know, trying to understand cryptocurrencies and trying to buy them and trying to, you know, and doing all of this stuff, then, you know, I think I have a, like a really good intimate understanding of how um, a person without much knowledge 
of you know data unions or cryptocurrencies can actually access but you know this thing about um you know concentrating on data literacy and bringing in those um those audiences that you know are usually the last people who are thought of mm -hmm. when new tech is being built that is mm -hmm. essentially important so i'm so i'm really focusing on you know the non-techie people the people from lower socioeconomic backgrounds mm -hmm. and you know devising strategies to connect with them is really important and like one kind of major um really practical way is to you know go where these people are right you know because the feedback I've got from from people because we've done focus groups and stuff like that is this like this kind of techie world scene seems a little bit like it's not for them right mm -hmm. and it seems a bit esoteric and it seems a bit like oh right okay so I don't think that's for us and I completely want to smash that perception right and uh, I'm talking to other people who work in um even other spheres like um you know, climate uh, and environmentalism, they kind of say the same thing of like, when you're trying to engage marginalized communities or people, you know, you have to go where they are. You have to go to them, right? And don't expect them to try and find you, right? You have to do the legwork, right? And, and, and actually, you know, it can't, it can't all be online. I mean, I know we're all online now because, you know, circumstances, but like, um, you know, you can't just be like a talking head online. You really, you, you really do have to go out and connect with people. And that's why, you know, this situation where we're basically all working remotely is another challenge. And so like, yeah, we are constantly thinking about that um and you know devising simple kind of ways for you know because all of this stuff can be broken down mm -hmm. all, all of this stuff can be broken down so um these uh, these are the things that we're concentrating on so tracy i just want to say that um when i was uh prepping for this talk my my oldest son uh he thinks that your block cell is really cool right so uh the product that you've created around cryptocurrency i was like can you explain this to me my oldest son is in cybersecurity, and so he sometimes you know he he helps me out um with things but you know to that i just want to say to the folks that are listening there are people right now uh from west virginia that are listening to this sitting on a walmart parking lot because they don't have internet um from their homes um and so tracy meeting the people where they are is uh critical to to this conversation and we have a couple of questions um from some folks uh from from uh, uh one from fanny um so fanny's asking um she wants us to talk about the difference between personal data and interpersonal data um, in relationship with other people. Should there be a difference in treatment? Enoch? Yeah, um, I think that, that that's, that's a very good question, Fanny. And um, it goes, I think, to the heart of a lot of what Radical Exchange talks about with the Data Freedom Act. Um, I think that Radical Exchange's Data Freedom Act is um, a wonderful piece of proposed legislation that focuses on the network effects of data, i.e. our data, not necessarily my data. And um, I do think that ultimately there will probably need to be a distinction between um, your personal data versus the data that's generated from, the inter from your interactions with other people. Mm. Um, you're starting to see that distinction, for example, with the California Privacy Rights Act which you know this dovetails with what crystal and tracy were just talking about in terms of um, marginalized communities um, the california privacy rights act which isn't doesn't is not effective until 2023 um, introduces the concept of sensitive personal information which includes things like your race your religion your union membership your genetics your biometrics your sexual orientation uh, etc and um, you know that is going to be considered highly protected, sensitive personal information that's relevant to you, um, as opposed to the data 
or the value of the data that's generated from the network effects uh, on the interactions online between, for example, me and Crystal or me or Tracy. Uh, but I think that that fight is something that is still further down the road because right now, at least in California, we're still even fighting over uh, over whether there's ownership over your own personal data. <laughs> so the well, R data, <laughs> yeah, the, we're at my data. We're still fighting for my data before we get to fighting for our data. Um, and sure. that's a very timely question, uh, Fanny, because last Thursday, there was an argument uh, in the California federal court where Google basically said, um, there are no ownership rights in data. And the lawyers uh, argued and said, no, under the CCPA and now the newly passed CPRA, there are in fact uh, ownership rights over online data that's generated uh, by you. So that was last Thursday. And then today, this Thursday at 1.30 California time, there's another argument again against Google on one of the similar situations where Google is taking the position that you know, there's basically no ownership rights to the online data that you generate. And so it's before the same judge, different case. And so we're, we're hopeful that this federal judge will be one of the first judges ever in the United States to rule that there are in fact ownership rights over data that you generate online. We've got lots of questions. Um, so let's, let's see, uh, Jennifer, uh, we must control data as something of collective property and not that of corporations property. Isn't this the main first hurdle that we have to overcome? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So the way I understand this question, or the way that I think about, you know, data is that it is, it is, you know, my data is 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 mine, and and I should own it and have control over it. But my data is only, uh, as 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 it, when it interacts with your data. So it is sort of, you know, uh, it's the collective property of the people, not of the corporations that are selling it. So um, she's asking, isn't this the 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 main first hurdle that we have to overcome? Is confronting data as something that is collective property of the people and not of the corporations. And right now, it is not our property. It is being bought and sold um, without our uh, consent um, and our agreement. Um, we also have another question um, from Fanny. I like Fanny. Uh, she, this is for you, Tracy. Um, she wants to know more about the technical aspect of controller and what it's intended to work and, and how we learn from controller. Technical aspects in, in like how we connect the, to the streamer platform. I mean, it, it's essentially uh, an end user app um, and we are utilizing the streamer network, which is a decentralized network, which has a data market. Um, so the thing is about data is like, on its own, your personal data is not actually worth very much. Right. Um, it becomes valuable when it's it's collective, right? So, you know, when your when your information is aggregated, then it can go to a platform like Streamer, and then people, you know, find it useful um, and they will purchase it. Um, so, you know, I'm not sure what other technical things that she wants to know. Maybe she could be a bit more specific. Um, thanks, Tracy. And, and just on that, on, on some tools questions uh, here, we have Kara and she's asking as a consultant for tech startups, um, how can she and others begin to educate founders on better data policies? Well, I think I think that's one for Enoch data policy. How can uh, tech uh, tech companies, you know, think about uh, startups or folks getting uh, creating products? What do, what do what do they need to be aware of in in their data policy? Well, I think that there's a lot of information available online um, about both compliance with the GDPR and compliance with the CCPA and the CPRA. Um, you know, there's a number of organizations out there like the IAPP, the International Association of Privacy Professionals, 
which has a number of online classes and certifications available for um, privacy professionals, for IT managers, for technology consultants, et cetera. And so I think that's, that's a pretty good place to start is to you know, go take a look at the materials that are available online, maybe take some of those courses on best practices and compliance with GDPR, compliance with CCPA, and as more and more states are passing similar legislation, I think you know you're, you're going to end up with uh, best practices to comply with both California and New York, or best practices to comply with California, New York, and Washington together. So, you know, though though, though there is no federal legislation in the United States, you're seeing the states with the most tech and with the most populations starting to pass mm -hmm. these types of laws because you know they can't they can't wait for Congress anymore. Can't wait for Congress. <laughs> um, so listen, I just want to, you know, uh, I just shoot it straight. Let's talk about the money. When are we going to start getting paid for our data? When, uh, when, does, when does this happen uh, for citizens of the world? Uh, and how is this going to happen? Or is this a, is this a dream? <laughs> no, it's not a dream. It's, um, it's, it's probably not as easy as people think it is. So um, in terms of, you know, in terms of, like my data unions, um, we have to grow to a certain amount of scale, um, you know, and let's say something like, you know, get maybe 50,000 users in, in a general location, just say 50,000 users in the UK, then, you know, it becomes a much more valuable, attractive, um, commodity for market buyers, you know, and then, and then, and, and then we can get rolling. I think it's, I think it's quite, um, you know, you have to, you have to build, mm -hmm. you have to build. So it's, it, 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 it's not really an instant, like, right, I'm going to connect this data and like, you know, I'm kind of off. Um, but like, it is, you know, it's happening. Um, it's happening, but it, you know, it's not, it's not instant um, and we're still you know everybody's everybody's still working you know I mean like we were talking um, me and Enoch before and I was asking how close he was to the um, a million number uh, their like goal for the, for their projects and they have a little ways to go so it's kind of that journey where we've 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 started and you know there's people working um, and you know we're kind of hoping um, especially in the european union because because the law is going that way and within the next maybe 12 to 18 months big tech corporations will have to open up their um, data to consumers and it's going to be a lot easier so we are getting there you know people like me and enoch are building furiously you know loads of projects at the same time and making all of these connections and like you know there's loads of people doing wonderful work all over the world but in the next 12 months I think you're going to see a real sea change and a real hopefully elevation and mul a multiplication of um, tech available for people to monetize their data and to get paid yeah yeah my, my answer Amen. <laughs> Amen. Uh, my answer in the United, I think my answer in the United States is a little bit different. Um, I think that in the United States, um, you are already getting compensated for your past harm done to your data. Um, and it's just a very inefficient mechanism. And that's called class action lawsuits. Mm. Um, data Dividend Project has promoted several of the data abuse related class action settlements on its website. For example, we launched in June 2020, and in July, we started promoting the Yahoo class action settlement, which paid cash for the, all the breaches that occurred if you had a Yahoo-based email. And um, we also promoted in November 2020, the Facebook biometric privacy settlement, which paid cash to users, Facebook users in Illinois for whom Facebook created a face template without your permission. So. The Yahoo settlement was uh, worth up to, I think it was $150 cash if you had a Yahoo account. 
um, and it's currently still being processed, but I think the latest report to the court was mm -hmm. that that amount is going to be about $50 because so many people chose the cash option as opposed to the credit protection option. And um, so that's an example of getting compensated for past data abuse. The Facebook Illinois settlement ended up being, I think, $350 cash per Illinois user that made a claim to that settlement amount. So that's one answer is you're already being compensated for past abuses to your data. It's just a very inefficient mechanism that nobody knows about, which is class action settlements. The other answer is that um, for ongoing use of your data, there are a number of startups in the United States that are already paying um, monthly uh, data dividends to people. Um, uh, I, I can think right off the top of my head of maybe four that have already started um, you know, you basically download an app onto your phone, you agree to share the following data, whether it's your location data or your shopping history or your cell phone data, et cetera. And um, you can make anywhere between, I want to say, $1 a month to $15 a month, depending yeah. on how much data you choose to share. Um, so it's already happening. And there are a lot of technology companies trying to um, solve this problem. As I mentioned, and out of the four legs of the chair, the, the, the technology leg is very important. And there's a number of companies trying to do it in the United States and Canada, and I know in Europe as well. Yeah, one of those companies, um, Streamalytics, uh, that Angela Benton started, um, is uh, one that I'm hoping to be uh, paid for my data from. Um, yeah, yes, 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 yes. So let's see here. Got a few more folks in the chat. You know, the thing that's so interesting about this conversation is it really is, um, it's, it's like you said, Tracy, it's the, it's, it's, it's the collective. My data is only valuable when it's connected to your data. And even in the conversation about the education for data rights, right? We have to create a momentum of people. Um, I think, you know, when you were talking about Enoch and Tracy was asking you about how is it going with the numbers, right? We have to have a groundswell of people in order to have this block of data and consumers or, or, or creators in a sense um, to really make a difference and to have a voice. And um, I'm, I just feel that part of the education process is really teaching people and helping people understand, you know, what what data is it is it is your basic uh, actually I don't want to answer it, 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 let, let just to kind of re-emphasize some of the basic ways that when we go through our day that we're creating data and how that's being sold I'm not sure we've we've um, sort of broke it down um, in that way so what is give an example of an, an average an average citizen of the world and how they're creating their data footprint and how that's being sold Well, I mean, you know, most people are on social media apps, you know, and um, I mean, most people have watched The Social Dilemma. I think they're probably quite aware that like, you know, the main, the main thing that people do is they, um, corporations do is they make profiles. So they're not really technically like selling little tiny little bits that, that they're kind of making a profile, which is very useful for other companies because then they know how to sell to you, what to sell to you, when to sell to you, <laughs> you know, uh, and all of these insights. So, um, you know, every time you're online, um, uh, data is being generated. And I think what a lot of people also don't realize is um, because nobody wants to read all of these terms and conditions, like who, who's got time to be reading terms and conditions, right? <laughs> so like, if we want to use an app, we we just go yeah yeah and um and then we're not aware that like some of these apps can read messages track locations even when they're not even they they have nothing to do with that you know maybe it's like some random app some random cooking app or something like that but like you know this app can still read your messages <laughs> track your location so um you know even when you're not probably even technically online, um, data is still being scraped like everywhere. So, I mean, you could go through a, a user's typical day of like turning on their phone, but you know, and, and, and messing around with apps, but technically you don't really even have to do that. Yeah, I think um, 
I think that um, Tristan uh, Harris from The Social Dilemma, he has a lot of very interesting TED Talks about this, but mm -hmm. essentially what he's saying is, um, is that they're creating digital, vo digital voodoo dolls uh, mm -hmm. for, each, for mm -hmm. each and every single one of us. And um, because of AI and machine learning um, and the, the vast amounts of data out there, they can basically predict based on your di digital voodoo doll uh, what you what you want to buy next or what you're interested in. Um, mm. And so that's um, kind of a, a spooky but um, apt analogy, I think. Um, so that's kind of, I think that's kind of the first party platforms. And when I say first party platforms, I mean, like, you know, the, the Facebooks, the Googles, the Amazons, the Twitters out there that you're interacting with on a daily basis. They basically, you know, take your digital activity and create a digital voodoo doll for you. Um, but there's also going on in the background an entire shadow economy that most people don't know about, which are the third parties. And the third parties, the reason they're called third parties is they don't actually directly interact with you and I. Um, they are called data brokers. And they're out there scraping up information about you, both from offline sources, you know, like state voting records or county mm -hmm. property records, et cetera. And um, the data brokers are marrying the offline data with the online data and then going and selling consumer segments to advertisers. And so that entire data, that entire data brokering industry operates in the background. And a lot of people don't know that data brokers are out there um, buying, selling, and reselling their information, but it's happening. And um, what really, I think, led to, and I think this is pre pretty publicly documented in, in books and, and investigative articles, what really re led to the taking off of advertising on the first party platforms was the marriage of the online data that the first party platforms collect about us with the data brokers data that they're getting in the real world about us. Because when they were able to marry those two and add them together, that's what led to you know, rocketing, skyrocketing stock prices, um, immense increases in value of the first party platforms. Yeah, and you know, radical exchange community is a pretty sophisticated community that um, you know that that, that that I I love being a part of it and and learning. Um, this is this is the piece that I'm I'm most interested in because it's the it's the it's the thing I think when you look at the money and what do they always say? Data is the new oil, uh, and the amount of money. I mean, this is the leading industry for the world. I mean, there are billions of dollars being made and citizens that are creating it are not um, are not receiving their compensation for it. And so this conversation that we're having here about how do we decentralize data unions and get organized, right? What are, I mean, you've got your organization, Enoch, you've got your organization, Tracy, but wh who are you guys connected to and, and who are you working with or, or what do you want people listening? How can they get involved? What's the, what's the, a, something they could do right now? I mean, there's, oof, that, uh, there's quite a few things that you could do, but like, um, in terms of in terms of like who I'm connected with, I mean, I'm making a film at the moment, so I'm um, I'm connected with Mozilla, and I think that I think I think the creative visual realm is a really good way of connecting people and getting a message to a mass audience, right? So like um, I'm actually part of the um, Black Interrogations co cohort. Uh, black interrogations of AI um, from Mozilla, and I'm gonna. I'm in the process of doing a film, and um, yeah, we basically we really want to connect people with the story. But the main thing is to kind of provide a visual manifesto and a roadmap of where we should be going, you know? So it can be something really, really as easy as, as you said, deleting Facebook or, um, you know, writing to your MP. But actually, we, I think we need to be forming new coalitions. We need to be forming new coalitions. We need to be um, 
educating. I mean, I love being part of um, Radical Exchange because, you know, they're really, really focused on designing, really designing practically what we need for the future. So, you know, in terms of quadratic voting and quadratic funding and mm -hmm. how we make new systems, you know, for governance and, you know, all of this stuff is like really, really important. And, um, you know, part of my film is to kind of like lay, lay that out. And I'm talking to an enormous amount of people. Um, and at the end of it, hopefully I'll come up with, um, like a really comprehensive uh, way for people to um, attack this situation and to help, you know, to help everything move on. Because I mean, this is a movement and I, and, you know, I would love to keep, you know, keep in contact with Enoch and like, you know, other, other people do, doing the same things all over the world, you know, because I think at some point there is going to be a tipping point you know, and at some point, I think we are, you, you know, there is going to be a mass collective action. Um, and I just think we need, we need to keep, we need to keep abreast of each other and we need to kind of like support each other. Um, Enoch? Yeah, um, I, I second everything Tracy said, but um, in terms of what the listeners today could do in terms of taking action right away, um, I like to also think of analogy as, as two sides of a coin. Um, side one of the coin is um, stopping your data from being collected and exploited by the first party platforms and the third parties. Side two of the coin is then joining a data coalition um, that is working to get help people get paid for their data. So you have to take you have, you have to use both sides of the coin. And so what can you do to stop the first parties and the third parties from exploiting your data today? Um, well, Number one, you can do what Jaron Lanier recommended and what Crystal did, which is delete your social media platforms. Uh, number two, um, at least Apple is starting in its iOS 14 to roll out a default setting where whenever you download an app, it'll ask you, you know, this app is going to track you this, you know, using X, Y, Z. Do you agree? Well, you should say no. <laughs> you, you don't agree. Mm -hmm. um, so those are simple steps that, that, that anybody can take today. Um, to stop the first parties and third party platforms from collecting your data. Um, you can all, and then the flip side of the coin is join a data coalition, join the data union, join the data dividend project, join one of the technology companies out there that's trying to do the right thing and help people um, you know, get paid for their data. Um, so those are, I think, two or three practical steps that you could do um, immediately. Uh, to um, help move the ball forward. And it doesn't hurt when you delete your Facebook, I promise you, uh, you will survive. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> I do have quite a, you know, I do engage on Twitter, which sort of just, you know, sorry, Jaron Lanier, you know, I haven't quite drank all the Kool-Aid, but um, I do find a, a lot of relief and, um, and I, I do feel as if I'm doing something by not participating in Facebook and even just the, 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 the shock of people, what do you mean we can't find you on Facebook, right? Because it's become such a, such a place um, that that allows me to open up the conversation um, about why, why I'm not participating in um, Facebook County is what I call it. I think there's more uh, people on Facebook than, you know, I don't, I don't know. And, and it's not to just keep rehashing um, Facebook being the only sort of quote unquote enemy to this, but it's just opens up the conversation and the dialogue, which is what we're doing here today, which is, you know, really how can we start to educate the public and citizens of their rights, right, which is basically what I love about uh, the data dividend project is that, you know, um, the data dividend project and I too believe that ownership and control of your data is a fundamental human right. Um, and when we start talking in language like that, um, you know, then you have to sort of say, well, what data is a human right? Um, so Tracy, how do you see data uh, as, as, a, as a human right? Good question. I mean, I've, I've, um, I've actually supported that, um, that movement 
or that um I don't know if there's a there was something I think you signed something but um but yeah I mean it, it's it's kind of like you know when you go to Taiwan and they think and they think that um having access to broadband and like digital hardware is a human right you know these these concepts are going to be um more and more acceptable so yeah essentially i have no problem with uh data being a human right i mean i know i know other people do um mm -hmm. but i think essentially you know it is something that you it's something that you produce it's something that you own you know all all, all of the personal interpersonal you know data conversations aside and um you should have a right to your property absolutely i mean i i i agree and you know i think that one of the things as we're all collectively going through an, an international you know a global pandemic um where we start to live in our computers and in our screens and we live in our data and i think this is just really just one of the things that, um, you know, uh, that we're learning, um, not only just about the health disparities, right, but uh, so many disparities. Um, and one of them is, you know, how, how all of a sudden, right, at least, it, like I said, there are people sitting on the Walmart parking lot today just to engage in this conversation because they don't have access to um, broadband, they don't have access to quality um, internet service and, and what mm. a deficiency that creates in people. So, you know, I love hearing from the, the, the technology minister of Taiwan. And so Enoch, I'm um, just curious about how data dividends really came up with this platform of, you know, uh, the ownership and control of your data is a fundamental human right. Uh, believe data then and now and always has value, right? I think this is might be the, the concept where, um, you know, we can, we can kind of close out and talking about the value um, of data um, and what to, to me, to the individual and to my family and to my community um, and, and why this is such an important conversation for this moment in time. Uh, for the future um, and for the, the decisions that we're making now and the policies that we're creating today and what's happening in California and what that means to the United States um, and and the world. This is uh, this is a conversation that, you know, you know, my great, 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 great grandchildren one day might discover in some library and uh, probably I hope they'll be proud that I was standing for their data rights. <laughs> yeah. Um so let me see if I can break break that question down into a couple of different pieces. Um, the first piece being, you know, data rights being human rights. Um, from from DDP's perspective, you know, the data dividend project, I think that um, we are approaching that statement from specific rights that are enshrined in the California Constitution. Um, privacy is considered a fundamental human right in the California Constitution itself. And so springing from that privacy right, um, that's where we're saying that um, data rights, the right to your privacy is also a fundamental human right. Mm -hmm. But this is where, and I think Tracy was referring to this, this is where a schism occurs between um, certain civil liberty organizations and organizations like, like DDP and maybe even Radical Exchange. Um, a lot of the civil liberty organizations basically stop there and say it's a fundamental human right. It's like a kidney. It should never be able to be licensed, sold, et cetera. Um, obviously, given the name Data Dividend Project, I fall on the other side of that line, and I think so does Radical Exchange, which is that you know, it's not enough to just say that it's a fundamental human right because of privacy. People have been saying that for a decade, and things have gotten much, much worse. <laughs> they haven't gotten any better. Um, so you have to link the privacy right to an economic property right as well. Mm. And the reason you have to link it to an economic property right is because um, once it's linked to an economic property right, you're incentivizing um, technologists, lawyers, accountants, et cetera, to come in and build better systems, to enforce rights, to audit rights. Because right now, when we're just saying that it's a fundamental human right without the economic property rights, you're just basically 
putting up your hands and hoping for the best that the tech that the tech companies are going to do uh, the right thing. And we've seen that's not going to happen, right? So that that's why um, I think the language of data unions, the language of collective bargaining, um, Crystal's um, uh, talk that she gave as the digital senator of West Virginia is so important, linking the language of collective bargaining, linking the language of labor to the data rights fight, I think is very important. And it's, I think it's too bad that um, James Felton Keith from the founder of the data union wasn't able to join us today because he has um, a lot of insight into this particular area. Mm -hmm. So I think that's for me, Crystal addressing the question of the fundamental human right language. Then separately, you asked about moving forward. And I think the question kind of uh, was around how to value data and how to value data as labor. Is, is that right, Crystal? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I go back to the work of Jaron Lanier and Glenn Weil. Of course, Glenn Weil is one of the founders of Radical Exchange. Um, they have a very, very uh, uh, great Harvard Business Review article that talks about mediators of individual data. And in there, mm. they measure or they propose different ways to measure what the value of the data is. Um, I think one way that they propose is you value it through an existing market marketplace. So things like like what Tracy's trying to build over in Europe and a number of companies in the United States, you know, that's one way to value it is just, you know, what is the market willing to pay for it? Um, there's also objective measurements. That's pretty, that's a pretty subjective measurement, what the market's willing to pay. There's also objective measurements. And um, I think what Glenn Weil proposed was taking a look at um, statistical algorithms. How well does the algorithm perform without the data versus how well the algorithm performs with the data? And the delta is the value of the data. So I, those are two ways to measure it. And of course, being a lawyer, um, the third way to measure it would be the, the civil uh, class action settlements I, I mentioned earlier. Uh, of course, that's a very rough, very imperfect way to measure it. I like the economist's way of measuring it better. Well, you know, Enoch, uh, my pastor says, uh, first we conversate, right? Then we demonstrate, right? And then we litigate, okay? So um, <laughs> so um, I love the work that you're doing and it is such a gift um, to speak with you both today. Um, uh, I'm both curious and anxious uh, to, uh, to be a part of this, uh, this movement uh, because I believe that it is, um, it is, um, it is just another way of the extraction economy, not only for uh, Central Appalachia, uh, my home that I represent as social media senator uh, for the Digital District of West Virginia, which is really hard to do when you delete your Facebook and also when you're struggling to find um, broadband, but it's an important conversation for the world. Um, and I just thank you all so much for uh, the energy that you're putting in and organizing and educating. Um, and hope that if there's anything I can do to be of service to you um, and your organizations that you'll reach out. And um, Tracy and Enoch, do you have anything that you'd like to share uh, as we close out how folks can find you or um, what, what, where you'll be next? Um, I'll, be, I'll be in the Radical Exchange Fellowship for the next month or so, building the Spotify Data Union, which is super exciting because it's tech meets politics. We're going to take on big tech um, and, <laughs> and, you know, hopefully de-silo all of this uh, information that, like, uh, Spotify are keeping to themselves. And it's, it, 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 it's, it's a really great idea and it's you know I'm really excited to be a part of it because you know artists on the Spotify platform have not been remunerated correctly mm. for um forever basically and have been exploited and it's kind of a way that like they can get another income stream as well which as an artist you know I'm really really um happy about but you know it's about leveling the playing field and um and I'm really excited to take that fight to Spotify. Um, and obviously I'll be at Hope, um, my project with Mozilla and controller app. So yeah, some really, really exciting projects happening over the next few months. Good stuff. Uh, 
you can find out more about um, the Data Dividend Project uh, online, datadividendproject.com. Uh, we're going to be launching uh, phase two of DDP's existence shortly, I, I hope as early as this weekend. And what phase two means is um, phase one was announcement and signups, which we did for the first eight months. And phase two is now that we have a number of people who have authorized DDP to act as their authorized agent, we are actually going to start doing mass opt-outs of the sale of your data. To uh, We're starting with the data brokers. There's a list of 400, and, I think 425 or so registered data brokers in the state of California. Uh, so we'll start opting all of our members out of the sale and sharing of their data um, uh, as phase two. Because um, like I said, it's two sides of the coin, right? One side is stopping the platforms and the third parties from using your data. The other side of the coin is going to find data unions that will get you compensated for uh, in, a, in an ethical way and a transparent way for your data. So we're starting to work on um, that side of the coin, opting you out of the sale and sharing of your data. All right. So uh, I don't know. We gotta we gotta have a chance if we're gonna have a union. My data, my money, right? Follow radical exchange. Get involved in the fight for uh, data rights. And um, thank you all so much for sharing with me today. And look forward to being a part of 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 this uh, call to action uh, for citizens uh, around the world to my data, my rights. Thank you all so much.